away. Ladies and gentlemen, let's begin today's installment of The Z Files. Because, you know, I come on here and I like to talk to you guys about science and reality, demonstrable reality. You know, the world that we experience, the world that we observe. The world that not only is observable, but measurable, testable, repeatable, actual reality. Uh, not fantasy. Not pretend. Reality. The world we experience. Some people say to me, oh, see, there is no objective reality. We're just making it up with our minds. Okay. I can get into that. We're conscious co-creators in this reality that we're participating in. We're all experiencing this in some way from an individualistic perspective, but that we're consciously and cooperatively contributing to this collective experience. I can get that. But can we not agree that there's a shared objective reality? That's how things function. You know, you don't think there's an objective reality. Uh, anybody ever spend some time in a surgical department in a surgical theater, surgical suite? Yeah, I have. When you're there and the knife comes out and somebody gets sliced open and you see all the stuff on the inside that's functioning. And then the doctor like can fix the thing that was going wrong on the inside. You're reminded very quickly that there's a shared reality. You understand what I mean? We're participating in a physical world. One of my pet peeves lately is this um, tendency for some in these community to just bring everything to such a state of confusion and diffusion as to imply that it's just a dream as such and there's not any shared experience here and no shared physical reality. I will retort, good sir or ma'am. Experience proves otherwise. Things can happen here. We are sharing an experience. If you are pricked, you will bleed. Let's get over that. So let's talk about this shared reality that we're experiencing here on Earth, what we say is Earth. So again, let's get into the Z files. Today I want to talk to you about this Earth, this Earth that we live on. This Earth that they say is a planet, just like all the other quote unquote other planets. See, that's what they're telling you. Earth is a planet, just like the quote unquote other planets. It's a claim, they keep telling you. It's a claim that goes against all of your observable, measurable experience. So questioning minds like me are consistently putting this claim to the test. So let's put it to the test, everybody. I'm ready to do it. And today in the Z Files, I want to bring you the case of one Felix, Felix Bumgardner and his Red Bull jump. Now, many of you have heard about this. I'm gonna, we're going to get into it. We're going to really get into it. I'm going to show you some things about this supposed Earth and this supposed globe that you're telling you you live on. Because I want you to remember something about a globe, which is a sphere. A globe needs to show certain components, well, evidence certain aspects, particular to a globe or a sphere. One is that it will have convexity, which is basically curvature in a three-dimensional uh, domain. Well, we're going to use the case of Felix Bumgardner and his 2012 Red Bull jump to show beyond the shadow of the doubt that indeed there is no curvature and no convexity. So Felix Bumgardner, um, he's an Australian skydiver, daredevil, and base jumper. And uh, he's most widely known for uh, the topic of today. Um, for jumping to Earth from a helium balloon from the stratosphere on October 14th, 2020, and landing in New Mexico as part of what was called the Red Bull Stratus Project. See, Red Bull sponsored it. That's why it's called the Red Bull Jump. 
which is good for Red Bull. You can get marketing now forever. They sponsored this apparently. Uh, Red Bull is just an energy drink. I'm sure almost everybody knows that, but I, I have to remind myself that I have listeners from all over. I'm pretty sure everybody knows what Red Bull is. Um, in doing so, he set numerous world records um, for skydiving. All right. One, he reached an estimated top speed of 843.6 miles an hour, which is faster than the speed of sound, or Mach 1.2. And he became the first person to break the sound barrier um, outside of a vehicle. He also broke records for uh, skydiving records for uh, altitude, right, and freefall distance. He reached an estimated height of um, about 128,000 feet, give or take. Would you think about that? 128,000 feet. Now let's put that into, uh, let's say, some into a relative understanding. Your average commercial airliner flight that you take. You know, you want to go anywhere, you jump on a plane, average commercial airliner. You're talking 25,000, 30,000, 35,000 feet, okay? It's typical cruising uh, altitude. A lot of you guys remember, some of my older uh, audience members will remember um, uh, an airplane called the Concorde. Now, the Concorde was a high-altitude, high-speed uh plane that was uh, famous for <clears throat> taking people uh, across the Atlantic very quickly. And that, uh, the Concorde was said to fly somewhere around, let's say, 50 or 55,000 feet cruising elevation, all right? Even uh, more incredible is the military aircraft called the SR-71. Yes, the SR-71, it's a military aircraft. United States has that apparently can reach altitudes up to 80 or even almost 90,000 feet. Okay. This is all above sea level. Here, Mr. Felix Bumgarner took his helium filled balloon and capsule up to 128,000 feet, exceeding even the SR 71 by some 40 or 30,000 feet in elevation. The only purported other uh, increase in elevation that we could uh, even show other than the presentation of NASA and SpaceX is these um, Blue Origin trips, these trips by um, Jeff Bezos and uh, his likes. Richard Branson's company, they're apparently are going uh, maybe, they say, 300,000 feet, okay, above the Earth's surface. Some people say 60 miles, 62 miles, give or take. But here we have this man. I'm going to show you. 128,000 feet above sea level. What that means. You still with me? Good. All right, so here we're seeing an image of inside the capsule at elevation. You can see the top of the screen where it says uh, 127,501 feet above sea level. You can see the time it took him to get up there. It took him about two and a half hours of ascension, ascending to get up there. Again, guys, it's a helium-filled balloon, plain and simple. Just a really uh, complex and advanced one, but no different than a helium balloon that your little kiddos walk around with on their birthday or whatever. Simple technology. All right, so uh, let's get into it. Again, inside the capsule. I want you to notice something. He slid the capsule door open, preparing for his ascent. I'm sorry, for his descent. I want everybody to look at the 
Look out the capsule door. What do you see? You see the horizon. Not only do you see the horizon, but you see a level and horizontal horizon. You also see a horizon that is rising or sitting right at eye level. It's at the level of the camera, which is eye level. Please note this horizon. All right, he's about to jump out. Same horizon. Thumbs up, Felix. Thumbs up. Here's the picture that was shown in all the mass media headlines of the day. I want you to juxtapose the horizon we just witnessed from inside the cabin to the horizon we're seeing through this image from a camera that was positioned outside of the craft. You see a difference here? That's right. No longer do we see that same level horizon, but we see a horizon that shows quite a bit of curvature. This is the image that people will point to, to say, look, Z, you dumb flurf, flat earther. Look at the horizon, it's curved. Felix Bumgarner went 128,000 feet above sea level. Look at that curve, Z, you're an idiot. Mm. And I kind of say back to them, well, yeah, you're right. I'm seeing a curved horizon, but I want you to take a look at the land underneath him. You see the river? Kind of like uh, to the left portion of the screen. Running from the bottom left portion of the image up towards his helmet. See that river? Do you see the geography of the land? Do you see the physical features? Um... That's New Mexico, everybody. What do you mean, Z? What's your point? <laughs> My point is, based off this image, yeah, you're seeing a curved planet, so to speak. You're seeing planet New Mexico, everybody. Do I need to explain it more? Yeah, but let me explain it more. When you use a fisheye lens, it will show curvature. Because if indeed we were seeing the actual curvature of the earth and not the curvature brought upon by the fisheye lens in regards to the horizon, you'd be seeing earth as New Mexico. You get it guys? You're not seeing the curvature of the physical geographic horizon. You're seeing curvature on the image taken from a fisheye lens. Plain and simple. But interestingly enough, this is the image that was shown through all mass media in regards to this. What was this one? Not the previous image, this one here from inside the capsule that shows a perfectly level and horizontal horizon. Uh, let me point this out to you guys too. Just a little similarity between the two words I just used. Horizontal and horizon, you kind of get it? Do you think maybe those two words possibly were derived from the uh, same etymology. Hmm. So we're going to debunk the horizon curvature right away by pointing to you that if that were the actual geographical horizon, Earth would basically be uh, the size of um, the uh, a small portion of the. Uh, southwestern united states do you get it guys yeah maybe some of you get it the other thing i want to point out is 
picture the Earth curvature shown from the ISS when you they show us those, you know, apparent videos from the International Space Station. We're seeing more supposed curvature here than they show us on the ISS, which is apparently 250 miles above the Earth's surface, right? It's obvious. Curvature we're seeing here is simply the result of a fisheye lens, plain and simple. Oh, you guys want more? That wasn't enough. You want more? All right, we'll continue. Again, look at the river, right? You're not looking at Earth curve. You're looking at a wide angle picture of New Mexico, plain and simple. All right, now we get to the money shot. Look who we have here, guys. It's our old friend, Mr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. See this guy? Anybody who doesn't know, that's Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's basically like the go-to guy when it comes to try to, uh, for academia, uh, to defend this supposed globe. And here he is presenting in front of an audience. All right. We're going to let him uh, take it from here, and then I'll be back in a few seconds. They made sure to photograph him standing there with a really wide angle lens, which curves horizontal lines. Right. So in the photo, you see this curvature of Earth's. All right, so he's talking about the image that we were just looking at, this Felix Bumgardner. Surface, and he's like, wow, he's in space. Look at that. No, he's not. At that height, you don't see, you don't see the curvature of the Earth if you are two millimeters above this beach ball. It is, you just don't. That stuff is flat. All right, Globy. So I don't expect you to believe your buddy Z here this morning as he explains this to you, but will you at least believe your high priest of globe science and academia, Mr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, when he tells you what I was just telling you, that at 128,000 feet above sea level, which he is basically uh, comparing to two millimeters above that beach ball globe he had, that at that level, indeed, as he says, that stuff is flat. Do we need to hear him say it again? Just to reiterate? Yeah, let's do it again. See, you don't see the curvature of the Earth if you are two millimeters above this beach ball. You just don't. That stuff is flat. Okay, so. So as Neil deGrasse Tyson reinforces what I'm telling you, and what indeed I basically come here each and every morning and tell you that that stuff is flat, good sir. Now, even more interesting to me, based off what he said, is um, this idea. Because people say to me, Z, I can see the curvature. Well, that's interesting because he's telling you right here that you can't see curvature at 20 or 21 miles at elevation, 128,000 feet. So how come people say, well, Z, well, I took a plane. I took it, I, I went, I went to Florida on a plane. 35,000 feet, 30,000 feet, 25. I saw curvature. Really? Because he's telling you you can't see curvature at 28,000 feet. I showed you an image from the cockpit of a level horizontal horizon at 28,000 feet. There's no curvature. But you want to tell me you saw it on a plane at 25,000 to 35,000 feet? Does that math work out? Of course not. I have people that try to tell me they can see curvature from the shoreline looking out over the ocean. So you, you're telling me you can see curvature from the ground, but here the high priest of scientism is telling you, you do not see curvature at 128,000 feet above sea level. So if you can't see it at sea level, if you can't see curvature from a commercial air flight, if you can't see it from the Concorde uh, 
airplane at 55,000 feet. If you can't see it from the SR-71 military plane at 75, 80, or even 90,000 feet, and you can't see it at 128,000 feet, then where's this supposed curvature? Where is it? Oh, that's right. Oh, the ISS pictures. That's right. The ones from NASA that show me that there's Earth curvature, but it's 250 miles above Earth's surface. Yeah, that's where it is. Hmm. Gotcha. All right. Let's continue. Now we're back in the cockpit where we started off at elevation with Mr. Felix Bumgardner. There's our horizon again when he opens it. Not only are we noticing that the horizon is level and horizontal, flat, but I want you to notice where the horizon line is in relation to this image. Let's continue. Now I want you to look at this image. This is from the ground, 10 feet elevation. Get it? He's on the ground. You can see the um, ground, you know, whatever that is. Right, he's obvious. This is when he was um, entering the uh, capsule. Notice the horizon line is the exact same place as it was on the ground, as it was at 128,000 feet above sea level. But what's your point, Z? What's your point, Z? My point is, if you lived on a globe, a globe that they say is. 24,901 miles in circumference at the equator. By necessity, as you increased in elevation, the horizon would drop. It would not remain at eye level. We see being demonstrated here very clearly that there is no change in the horizon line. It remains at the level of the observer, which in this case is the camera. Obliterating any possibility that you live on a globe. Let's continue. See it? Now we're back up at elevation, 128,000. The horizon line remained the same. It would be impossible on a sphere. it again and again no movement the horizon remains at eye level at the highest elevation we could imagine I keep telling you every single morning over and over again you do not live on a globe because the globe is impossible based off all observable testable measurable reality plain and simple i don't care how big the lie is i don't care how many people would have to be in on it i don't care if the lie is too big too grand for you to comprehend it to accept it that matters not here we go again with the demonstration this is just a ground level. As you rise from ground level, viewing this skyscraper, you will see the horizon line remains steady. It stays at the level of the observer. This is indisputable. This works if you're looking at a small scale elevation, like we're seeing here with this, the skyscraper, or up to 128,000 feet. All right. This is showing, the examples I'm showing here this morning are showing that what we call the horizon is indeed not a physical phenomena. It is apparent. Horizons are apparent. They're based on your perspective. And the reality is that horizons 
will generally remain at eye level no matter the observer's elevation. Now, there may be some obstruction from atmosphere. That's why I say the horizon will generally remain at eye level because atmospheric conditions can change the horizon. It can obscure and obstruct the horizon. Things like haze, moisture, miraging, dust particles, the location of the sun. There are certain factors and conditions that exist in this atmosphere that can affect the horizon. Meaning to say, if you took a camera and you put it across a body of water and you left it there all day, you would notice the horizon line may indeed change based off conditions. Again, another proof showing that you're not looking at a physical or geographical horizon line. The horizon is based off your perspective. It's apparent It comes down to the law of perspective, which involves the principles of convergence and divergence. The image will converge to a central focal point. That's how perspective works. It's plain and simple. When you're looking at this world, you have to understand optics, how vision works. You have to understand optical phenomena. It's just the way we see things. No more, no less. This is just some images of how they launched him off in his capsule, just to give you an idea. All right, so again, to reiterate, at ground level, the horizon, there it is, and again the horizon at elevation, at all times, level, horizontal, and there's no change. In horizon, the horizon does not drop at elevation. It remains at eye level in regards to the perspective of the observer. This is fact. This isn't theory. When I discuss this topic, I'm showing you all facts. These are phenomena. The phenomena says that there is a horizon I should say the phenomena shows a level horizontal horizon that does not move from eye level at great elevation, plain and simple. And I will reiterate, there is no globe. You do not live on a spinning sphere in space because it is impossible. The model given to you, the model conditioned into your consciousness from day one, the model that has been promoted for 500 years at least and pushed and advanced in the last 150 years through popular academia is impossible. When you say to me, Z, what does it matter? Because it could either be a globe or flat. I say to you, no, you are wrong because something cannot be an impossibility and this insane, crazy globe that they keep telling you that you live on is an impossibility, plain and simple. And now here we have a model, an illustration of what it would look like. On the left is an example of everything I just explained. At 24 miles, which is 126,000 feet above sea level, right about where he was, you see on the left image here what the horizon should look like if you lived on a globe. Notice, 
it has dropped significantly below eye level. Because if you lived on a globe with a geographic horizon, it would drop down as you elevate. Because when you elevate, you can see further. It would look like what you see on the left. You would see the convexity. You would see the drop. But that's not what we experience in reality. Because in reality, we see the image on the right. You see a horizon that remains at eye level, that remains perfectly level and horizontal. The case is closed on the globe. We're at a point now where the evidence is irrefutable and indisputable. The only thing holding the globe together in the heliocentric model is people's belief in the lie. It only exists in fantasy. It only exists in sci-fi movies. It only exists in science fiction magazines. It only exists on your TV screen through their fake news presentation. It only exists in the halls of this bullshit academia that has been propped up by these elite bloodline psychopaths to deceive you and everybody else. The powers that shouldn't be know exactly what I'm saying. I'm just telling you what they already know, what they've been hiding from you for years, plain and simple. I don't care if you believe me, facts are facts.